Awesome. So, uh, just a cut here. Takataka te hau ki te uru, takataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a maa kina kina ki uta, ki a maa taratara ki tai. E hi aki ana te atakura, e tio, e huka, e hauhu, tihe, Māori ora. Welcome everybody, thank you so much for coming along. My name is Jala and I just wanted to start by opening the space with an acknowledgement of our tangata whenua and our tupuna and here in Aotearoa and the mana whenua of both the land that we are broadcasting from here and the land that you are on joining us on this call. Before I introduce our session and our lovely presenter here, I just wanted to take us through some quick little housekeeping. Um, so first a reminder that uh, this webinar will be about sexual violence particularly in relation to rough sex and choking and pornography. So please keep those in mind as you kind of focus on your self-care throughout the session um, and look after yourself. There will be a, a safe to talk line popped in the chat. Um, so if anyone would like to access that, please do so whenever you need. Um, this will also be a recorded session. So if you need to leave at any point, please feel free um, and you will have the access to the recording later on. Uh, during the session, please feel free to interact with each other using the chat function. Just make sure that you've changed the setting to everyone rather than to panelists so that everyone can see your message. And please also feel free to pop your questions in the Q&A box at any point throughout the session, and we will do our best to get to those at the end. Um, so again, we will be recording this webinar and we will send it out to all participants afterwards along with a list of uh, resources that are going to be mentioned throughout uh, the session. So finally, welcome again to you all. Um, and I would like to hand you over to Dr. Samantha Keane, who will introduce herself and then let you know what's happening. Uh, kia ora koutou, everyone. And thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day today uh, to attend this webinar. Uh, thank you very much to Jala and to Miriam and to Tornesk uh, for hosting this and providing an opportunity to have a discussion about uh, the influence of pornography uh, and rough sex in particular, and to provide a, a, a space for having some critical discussion about this, uh, because we are seeing increasing uh, engagement in rough sexual behaviours, uh, and also needing urgently to know more about uh, this emerging cultural phenomenon. So my name is Dr. Samantha Keane, and I am a lecturer Pukinga in Criminology uh, in the School of Social and Cultural Studies at Te Heringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. I've been at Victoria for the last 18 months or so, um, and uh, I'm working at the moment on a range of uh, different pieces of work, primarily in the rough sex space. So I'm uh, really interested in defining and understanding what we consider rough sex to be. Uh, and I'm working on publishing my PhD research uh, as a book with Rutledge, uh, which is provisionally titled um, Pornography, Rough Sex and Gendered Harm. I've had an interest in sexual violence research for a number of years uh, and am really uh, thankful to have the opportunity to speak with you today. As Jala has already mentioned, uh, we're obviously going to be talking about issues such as pornography, rough sex and choking. Uh, I won't be showing any pornography uh, or any instances, if you like, of rough sex uh, during this presentation, but would like to forewarn that there is one slide in particular that includes definitions of rough sex that have been taken from mainstream pornography websites. So that uh, can be quite confronting for some people. So I will forewarn before I move to that slide uh, so anyone can turn away if they wish, and I won't be reading that out. But in terms of the presentation today, I'm going to sort of briefly examine the emergence of rough sex as a bit of a cultural phenomenon over the last decade. I'm going to try and make an attempt to sort of briefly trace where that's come from and how we can see some instances in popular culture that allude to this being something that is celebrated or glorified in some spaces. I'm then gonna provide a bit of a review of the research around rough sex to date. Uh, and have a think about what we know about rough sex thus far, uh, which, as I'm going to discuss, is quite limited. Despite uh, the emergence of rough sex in popular discourse, 
but also the emergence of rough sex in criminal cases, perhaps most famously for us in Aotearoa, uh, thinking of um, the trial of the man that murdered Grace Millane, uh, we certainly saw rough sex coming to the forefront of public discussions at that time. I'm then also going to have a, a wee discussion about why I think it's important for us to work on defining rough sex um, and have a think about why pornography might be a key indicator for how we understand rough sex and, and where we can start putting our efforts into thinking about that. And then I'm going to finish off with some of the key challenges that I see uh, from my perspective um, and from the research that I've been involved in, having a think about what are the, the key issues or challenges or some of, I'm sure there are many more and I would love to hear, uh, particularly for those of you working uh, in the sector uh, and working with victims, survivors of sexual violence, what, what we can do about this, what are the key issues and what are our next steps forward. So I'll share my screen and thank you to all for your introductions uh, in the chat. I, I won't be able to check in on them as we go through, uh, but we we'll can certainly see you all there, which is fabulous. All right, so if uh, you do have any questions or any feedback, please don't hesitate to stay uh, for the Q&A at the end of the discussion. Alternatively, you can email me. Uh, at samantha.keen at vuw.ac.nz. I'm also pretty prolific on Twitter and do like to share um, my thoughts and perspectives on issues relating to sexual violence and criminal justice. So do um, follow along on those conversations as well. So we've had decades of feminist research, activism and advocacy, uh, which has you know, importantly cast a light on experience of sexual and, and family violence. We know an awful lot more now than we did historically. And feminist criminology in particular, as a discipline, has been able to give us some really important insights into women, uh, men's and children's lived experiences of violence. And there's been a lot of focus on the prevalence of sexual violence, and it remains an important part of feminist criminological agendas. But despite the wealth of research on sex and sexual violence that we thankfully have now, remarkably little attention has been paid to what is commonly called rough sex, despite it seemingly emerging as somewhat of a cultural phenomenon over the last decade. So I alluded to the fact uh, that we saw rough sex coming to the forefront of public discussions in relation to uh, the trial of the man that murdered Grace Mullane. Uh, but claims of consensual rough sex that have ended in death actually date back to the 1980s in the United States, uh, known as the preppy murders. Uh, and it's mostly over the last decade, though, that we've had increasing intention given to rough sex in popular culture. It is perhaps no surprise that this coincides with the publication of the wildly popular, but also immensely controversial, Fifty Shades of Grey book trilogy uh, by E.L. James, which came out uh, in 2011. So for those of you, I'm sure if you've uh, taken the difficult step to actually engaging with the book, um, <laughs> you'll understand that it describes a BDSM sexual relationship uh, between Anastasia Steele and Christian Grey. And the book received widespread appeal uh, and it was the best-selling book of the decade. Uh, it was subsequently made into a movie series in 2015. But the book and its subsequent cinematic representations were heavily criticised due to its inaccurate depiction of BDSM behaviours. Fifty Shades, in many ways, casually conflates what could be good sex, so sex which is mutually pleasurable and consensual, with violence. So Anastasia experiences harm during sex despite giving consent, and she gives consent because she loves Christian rather than consenting because she knows within herself that's what she wants and is effectively communicating with and having her boundaries respected by her partner. Research into the effects of, uh, sorry, into uh, the relationship 
described between Anastasia and Christian has signaled that it was actually at many times very emotionally um, abusive, uh, coercive, and again, that conflation of sex and violence uh, was regularly depicted. Now, of course, Fifty Shades is not the first explicit novel to discuss uh, BDSM or violence during sex. Erotic literature has a long history of these genres. Yet few books have gained such mainstream, international sort of cult status, if you like. Cementing Fifty Shades is one of the most infamously popular books of our generation. But it's not just Fifty Shades that we see allusions to what we can consider or, or conceive to be rough sex. Contemporary magazines such as Cosmopolitan magazine and Men's Health magazine have printed lifestyle pieces since about 2014 about things such as the problems only people who like rough sex will understand, uh, as you can see referenced on this slide. So this was in Cosmopolitan on the 29th of October, 2014. Men's Health also um, in 2020 in July published a piece about how to choke your partner safely. Uh, so we are seeing these spaces sort of encouraging and having discussions about how to engage in what we could perhaps understand to be rough sexual behaviours. Uh, also on the slide, so in 2018, Pornhub, a popular contemporary pornography website, published a ranking of their extreme categories, showing that rough sex was at its peak of popularity as a category in 2013, uh, and that that has dwindled over more recent years. That said, however, being in the top 50 pornography categories on Pornhub is no mean feat, uh, given the significant amount of pornography that is available on these websites and the popularity. So research uh, or data analytics from Pornhub in particular uh, signal that they received 42 billion site visits in 2019 alone. Most recently, uh, the movie 365 Days, which you can also see on the screen, was released on Netflix and received widespread criticism for its eroticization and glorification of kidnapping and sexual servitude. So in the film, the plot sees Laura kidnapped and held captive by mafia boss Massimo, who gives her a year to fall in love with him before he will free her from his control. Backlash to the film included a petition with nearly 100,000 signatures calling for Netflix to remove the film from its service, but it also received significant support, particularly uh, from young people that were viewing uh, this R18 production. So for many, the film was described as displaying intensely erotic sex between Massimo and Laura, and it actually led to the formation of a TikTok challenge called the 365 Days Challenge, where people shared their post-coital videos of bruised limbs in an attempt to demonstrate their ways of emulating the type of sex that was displayed in the film. As well as that, reaction videos were widely shared that showed people expressing their interest in being kidnapped by the lead actor and their desire to be choked by a man like Massimo. And it's been confirmed, apparently, that sequels are in the making. So alongside the proliferation of rough sex, um, we are seeing it frequently being referred to uh, in men's and women's magazines. So I alluded to the men's health section. So you can see the title here, why some people are turned on by choking during sex and how to do it safely, according to experts. So when this was originally released, this was accompanied by a tweet that promoted it with, before you try breath play in bed, read this. Online criticism of this article contributed to a rewrite with men's health then promoting how men can choke their partners safely. And women's magazines are, um, you know, often producing a, a relationship advice, if you like, that's suggesting how you can ask your partners for rough sex, which is presenting rough sex as something that is agentic, uh, and in many ways often a playful way of extending your sexual repertoire with your partner. So Cosmo frequently prints articles about rough sex that position it as the natural progression for sexual partners to try to help spice up their sex lives, if you like. 
And as you can see here, rough sex is positioned as something that women are genetically hope, supposedly asking for, but the allusion to hoping he's not a psychopath is perhaps an acknowledgement and a direct signal of the dangers of this kind of activity. So with this whole discussion about what rough sex is, there has been very little dedicated attention to understanding what counts, if you like, as rough sex. And it's particularly important that we work on defining what we understand rough sex to be, given the spectrum of behaviours that can occur within an understanding of what rough sex is, but also to recognise the breadth of experience uh, for people engaging in these behaviours. So in recent years, we have seen an increase in the use of the rough sex defence in courtrooms around the world perhaps most famously in Aotearoa for the murder of Grace and Elaine. Uh, but the rough sex gone wrong defence accounts for defences in the UK in over 60 cases of intimate partner femicide uh, in recent decades. Public lobbying by groups such as We Can't Consent to This has contributed to a wave of support for changing the law around what can be introduced as a defence in cases of intentional grievous bodily harm during sex. And the passing of the Domestic Abuse Act in the UK on the 29th of April has effectively banned the use of the rough sex defence in theory. Practically, we are still to see how this will function. But understanding how rough sex is defined is important and how those definitions are informed is important because it helps us understand where people might learn to draw the line in relation to consensual and non-consensual rough sexual behaviours and to understand the boundaries between consensual rough sex, sexual coercion, and violence. Defining rough sex has implications for researchers and how we design our studies, for clinicians, for those working with victim survivors of sexual violence, but also for communication between and with sexual partners, for sexual education, development, and delivery, for sexual violence prevention, and there are a range of issues that understanding rough sex raises for those working in the criminal justice system. It's particularly important for us to work more on defining rough sex because it's not just an issue that's occurring in cases of intimate partner homicide. So internationally, concerns about the rough sex defence are often being, uh, you know, sort of associated with cases of intimate partner homicide. But we know that the, these defences or, or claims that sexual violence was just rough sex uh, are occurring in criminal cases in Aotearoa. So in 2018, James Charles Lodes faced six charges of rape and sexual assault against his sexual partner. She claimed that she was hit, choked and raped and the attack was so severe that she vomited. She cried, she was swearing, she was saying no, she requested for the attack to stop but the defence lawyer said that these protestations were part of a thrill for a couple who had experimented with role play for a year and a couple that had a safe word, one that she did not use during the assault. In drawing attention to role play in this case, the jury accepted that the accused would have reasonable grounds that he did not know she was no longer consenting and James Charles Lodes was found not guilty of rape and assault. Later on, so that was in 2018, in 2020, Dunedin man Michael Daniel Fraser was accused of raping two women that he met on Tinder who shared remarkably similar stories of being choked non-consensually during the attack. The women did not know each other. Michael took the stand and said that all of the sex that took place was consensual, that pressure around her neck was simply his hands being placed on her collarbone and not strangulation, and he described the rough sex as a form of dominance and something that he found exciting. The jury heard testimony from his ex-partner who he had choked during sex, and she signaled that he would choke me, but I was okay with it. I didn't care. It was just like a dominance thing. It was just kind of normal. Michael was found not guilty on all accounts after a jury returned unanimous verdicts that he had not slept, choked, and suffocated his sexual partners. So bearing all of that in mind, how has rough sex been defined to date? 
So rough sex is a term that has been poorly defined in academic literature thus far, and it lacks in specificity in a lot of ways. Many of the definitions are conflicting, with some specifying certain behaviours as indicative of rough sex, whereas others specify more contextual circumstances that give an idea or allude to the types of sex that might count as rough. Further, many of the definitions conflate BDSM and rough sex. And in many ways, a lot of the definitions overlap uh, and are distinctly different in other ways too. So there's a lot of sort of theoretical work that needs to occur in this space uh, for us to think and understand more about what rough sex is. So as an umbrella term, rough sex refers to a wide range of physical behaviours. So thinking about these behaviours on a spectrum, it can include everything from choking or otherwise known as non-fatal strangulation through to slapping, biting, hitting, scratching, whipping. Uh, and it's important to recognise that whilst there are overlaps with BDSM, uh, the academic literature thus far suggests that rough sex should be considered as distinct from BDSM and that it appears to be happening much more regularly and in a different space in the sense that it's distinct from kink and BDSM communities that typically make concerted and, and substantive attempts to form and foster consent practices within their communities. And the difference is that rough sex as well appears to typically involve penetrative intercourse. So rough sex requires penetrative intercourse in some space, in some way or form throughout the activity, whereas not all BDSM sex would require penetration. So sex may not be a compulsory part of that interaction and the focus may well be more on power than, than sex, if you like. But it's really important for us to have a think about how we define rough sex, because recent research suggests that engaging in rough sex behaviour is actually quite common. So a recent survey of nearly 5,000 college students uh, in the United States reports that nearly 80% of students had participated in rough sex. The five most commonly reported behaviours in relation to rough sex were choking, hair pulling, spanking, being pinned down and being tied up. The finding that 77% of college students believed choking to be sort of the key indicator of what rough sex is, uh, is quite a departure from earlier academic understandings of what rough sex is, which don't typically identify choking as being a core or central focus of rough sex. And this is perhaps unsurprising given the presence of choking in contemporary mainstream pornography, particularly heterosexual pornography. In relation to choking during sex, um, a recent survey of 4,000 college students in the United States finds that choking in particular is a popular uh, activity during sex. Popular, I mean, unfortunately, we don't know much about uh, how consensual this is, but we do know that it is happening regularly. So one in three women reported that they had been choked during their most recent instance of oral, vaginal or anal sex. And looking only at penile vaginal intercourse, 33% of women reported having been choked and 33.8% of men reported choking their partner. But whilst choking in that research was more common among established partners, so people that were in relationships, nearly 20% of men and women indicated that the choking that they had experienced in their most recent sexual encounter occurred in the context of a first meeting. And I think that's an important distinction to make given the, the commonness, if you like, of, um, well, you would hope that people would be able to have more conversations about boundaries in relation to a particularly dangerous sexual behaviour in an established relationship. We know that that's certainly not always the case and that the majority of intimate partner sexual violence is 
occurring with someone that the person knows. Um, but when we are seeing rates around this occurring in the context of a first meeting, um, as I'm going to discuss later on, I think we, ha we have some concerns about what that might mean for criminal justice system practice uh, in terms of evidence too. So I think it's important for us to recognise that many participants may consensually desire to engage in behaviours such as choking during sex, but it's also important to recognise that these behaviours are often reported as scary or something that, you know, induces a feeling of fear during sex. So we actually need more research that examines the desirability uh, and or, or the wantedness, if you like, of rough sexual behaviours with intimate partners. So I've talked a bit about the spaces that we might learn about what rough sex might be or, or spaces in popular culture that do talk about what rough sex could be and how that could inform uh, lay people's understandings of what rough sex is. But I think there is another space that we can look to further understand what might inform what we understand rough sex to be. And I suggest that rough sex is a good place to start due to pornography's potential role in helping people to acquire, activate, and apply sexual, strip, sexual scripts in their sexual encounters. So briefly, sexual scripts are the cues, if you like, that we follow when we engage in sex, and they're uh, informed by a range of cultural sources. So in relation to rough sex pornography, then, which is a specific category uh, available on several pornography websites, probably more. Uh, and, you know, pornography can act as a primer for the development of sexual scripts. It can affect whether people acquire particular sexual scripts. So these might be new scripts that people are learning about if they haven't been informed about um, sexual scripts already. But pornography can also contribute to the activation of pornographic sexual scripts in offline encounters. And so when we think about these sexual scripts that we might see in pornography, which is perhaps the most explicit demonstration of what rough sex could be, sexual scripts can be reiterated and reinforced through popular culture, through mainstream movies, through Netflix, through erotic literature, through social media, and through discussions with friends, family and partners, and online discussions. And I also think it's helpful for us to consider the authority of or the influence of pornography within the structure of the online pornographic landscape. So uh, Ellen McKee, Brian McNair and Anne Watson contend that rough sex may be somewhat ex-nominated in the porno sphere as everyday sex, precisely because the kinds of people that are searching for and engaging pornographic representations of sexuality may not be the type of people who value romantic or monogamous vanilla or gentle sex as the best kind of sex. So searching online for pornography may be less likely to produce images of gentle, vanilla or respectful sex, even if that's something that you're specifically looking for or seeking. Now that's not to say at all that people cannot be or are not critical consumers of sexually explicit content. We certainly know that people are and can be, and we know that this provides an important outlet for education, for thinking about how we can counter some of the messaging that may come through in pornography. But it's important to consider how the capitalist production of pornography and the algorithms on pornography websites can work to tailor the content that is presented to you and model a particular type of sex or um, sexual scripts. So for example, when I am at work, on my work computer, if I type in rough sex on a pornography website, I'll see more explicit versions of rough sex than if I look at it on my home computer where I try not to have uh, a, a decent search history in relation to rough sex. And a recent survey or a recent examination of mainstream pornography suggests that when you are a brand new user without having visited a pornography website as yet, uh, you're more likely to see content that has sexual violence as a sexual script in mainstream pornography. So things that would count uh, what, with what we understand sexual violence to be are certainly present in those spaces. 
So when thinking about the levels of choking that I referred to recently uh, during sex through the surveys with um, American college students, I thought it would be helpful to sort of present the very little research that exists around choking in pornography specifically. So choking is commonly depicted in contemporary pornography. Uh, and a recent analysis of over 4,000 heterosexual pornography scenes suggests that choking is in the top five most common forms of physical aggression uh, that is displayed. And it's important also to note that women are the ones who are being choked in pornography, and men are the ones primarily who are doing the choking in uh, relation to heterosexual pornography. So in thinking about that, you know, it's, I think it's important for us to dedicate our understandings around sexual scripts and having a think about the influence that pornography can have. Because we certainly know that whilst non-fatal strangulation has certainly been an ongoing problem uh, in intimate partner violence and certainly recognised uh, as an issue, uh, as a severe issue with responses uh, from the criminal justice system, so the introduction of our strangulation as a standalone offence has been a recognition of that. But what, what we need to sort of start dedicating our attention to is the sort of the common engagement in choking during sex, given uh, the dangerousness of the act, uh, but also the issues around consent that I've identified. So thinking about rough sex in pornography then, so if, they, if we are worried about sexual scripts and we're thinking about sexual scripts, when we start thinking about the definitions of rough sex that are offered through pornography, I think that can help us understand why we need to be concerned about the way that pornography functions in this space. So online pornography is very much a duopoly, if you like. So there are two main sort of players uh, that govern the, the majority of the popular pornography tube sites. So MindGeek and WGCZ Holding. And in putting together a chapter for an upcoming book on rough sex and the criminal law, I explored the definitions of rough sex that were offered on pornography websites to better understand how these differ from the academic definitions that have been offered to date. And in selecting websites from the MindGeek network, so Pornhub, YouPorn, and RedTube, they all provide definitions of what they understand the rough sex category of sex to be. And you'll remember that Pornhub alluded to that earlier in this presentation, being one of the more popular categories. So I'm going to put these definitions up on the screen now. So please do note that they include explicit language. Uh, and if you are feeling confronted by these, please turn away and, and I won't read them out. Uh, they have been slightly redacted for size. But in canvassing these definitions, rough sex is largely presented as something that is remarkably gendered in nature. So rough sex is presented as something that is, is seen to be more intense than regular sex. Uh, and as you'll see, wild or animalistic. But at the same time, what I noticed across these definitions in comparison to the way that academic discussions about rough sex and published literature have occurred to date, academic definitions often present rough sex as something that's playful, a bit sort of cool, a bit, a bit you know, normal now. Whereas these definitions suggest that there is brutality involved, punishment, and they're very gendered in the sense that they are written primarily by and for the male gaze, presenting women as largely the receivers of rough sexual behaviours uh, versus the ones that are actively uh, engaging or enforcing rough sexual behaviours. So I think it's helpful for us as well to recognise that many of these definitions usually neglect to indicate that the type of behaviours uh, being presented in rough sex pornography are consensual. Uh, so whilst that may not be dissimilar to much pornography generally, I think if we are talking about a more intense or more extreme type of pornography, then thinking about consent becomes ever more pressing. So only one of the definitions explicitly mentions consent. Um, so that is the definition provided by RedTube. 
Uh, and we certainly know um, that many pornography videos may be consensual and scripted, uh, but the ways in which they depict consent, particularly in rough sex categories, suggest that uh, rough sex is very much something that men do to women uh, in heterosexual pornography. As well as that, most clearly, the behaviours are typically referring to intense penetrative sex. So I think it's important for us to really recognise um, the ways in which pornography can provide, if you like, a script for learning about what rough sex is, uh, and obviously as well providing a display for how rough sex progresses in relation to sex. As well as that, um, pornography websites often define rough sex through the tags, if you like, that are associated with the rough sex category. Uh, and I've put a, a word cloud together of these behaviours that were commonly recognised uh, and referred to uh, in relation to rough sex on Pornhub, YouPorn, RedTube and X videos. And so you'll see here there are words such as screaming and pain, uh, and roughness that really indicate that perhaps this idea that rough sex is always agentic and uh, playful and engaged in consensually may well not be what is being reflected in contemporary mainstream pornography in this category. So I think it's important for us to really continue our efforts to be defining rough sex in this space due to the challenges that arise in rough sex might raise. And I'd be really keen to hear about the issues that you think uh, what I've presented today might raise, uh, particularly hearing from you uh, in relation to what's happening on the ground with the types of things that you might be dealing with. But these are the challenges that I certainly see coming through. So I think that we're unfortunately seeing uh, increasing pressure across age brackets for people to want to be engaging in rough sex. And with that comes almost like a new divide, if you like. So previously, well, and still today, wider sexual double standards dictated that we had, if you like, a bit of a Madonna or dichotomy. But arguably, it's almost as if our sexual double standards have been extended in some ways. So women in particular are expected to be adventurous and or kinky, or down for whatever, uh, to avoid being labelled vanilla, which appears to be a new version that's doing the rounds, positioning normal or everyday sex as boring, and rough sex as both everyday, but exciting. I'm also particularly concerned about the way that choking is portrayed in contemporary pornography and how it eroticizes one of the most known indicators of lethality in intimate partner uh, relationships. So choking is often presented as something that heightens the pleasure of the woman who is being choked, which could have, when we think about the influence that pornography can have, it can affect women's desire perhaps to engage in these behaviours or the expectation that they should want to engage in these behaviours because we certainly know that pornography is not just viewed by men. But at the same time, it can also present choking as something that what, is, is what women want. And when we think about that being reiterated in men's health magazine that positions something like breath play is something that people might want to engage in, then we need to think about, okay, well, how can we counter some of these, some of the messaging that we're seeing in, um, in pornography? There seems to be a range of inconsistencies around people, uh, around how people understand and navigate the complicated world of rough sex. So not only is academia fraught with ill-defined attempts to locate the origins and, and parameters of rough sex, but people and clinicians, uh, unfortunately, have inconsistent understandings as well. So the inconsistencies involved in understanding exactly what it is that counts as rough sex is dangerous because it essentially complicates conversations around how we communicate our sexual boundaries with sexual partners. But if people are engaging in rough sex, how are they communicating what their boundaries or limits are? 
And how are they able to communicate those boundaries and or limits if they are, for, for example, being choked during sex? How do you verbalise or non, uh, use non-verbal body language to indicate that things are progressing too far or indeed that that behaviour wasn't um, desired for at all? In a world where sexual violence is endemic, how do we know that those limits will be respected and, and how do you communicate that um, safely? When it comes to rough sex and its implications for the law, it probably comes as no surprise that consensual rough sex is increasingly being used as a defence, uh, but there are numerous international cases where male partners are being found guilty of manslaughter, for example, in cases of intimate partner homicide, you know, following claims that it was merely rough sex that just went wrong. So I alluded at the beginning uh, that the domestic abuse bill in the United Kingdom has been introduced to counter some of this, but we actually don't know how that is going to function in practice, so how this will pan out in law. Um, but it is a recognition of the rise of rough sex and the need for the law to catch up with new, um, uh, new issues that are arising in this space. I'm also particularly concerned about the way that text message or social media evidence is used as testimony of consent to rough sexual practices. So in a number of criminal cases recently, text history with complainants that documented their initial consent for rough sex was used against them in court. I'm also concerned that research, such as the research I have mentioned uh, in this presentation today, uh, perhaps um, around choking, for example, this idea that one in three women uh, were choked at their most recent instance of uh, penetrative sex, that could actually end up working against its primary purpose of learning more about what rough sex is and be used to essentially suggest that this is what women want in court cases. When we consider this amidst the wider social uh, backdrop that I've discussed today, it's particularly concerning given the knowledge that many people still endorse outdated and sexist beliefs that adhere to rigid sexual double standards about masculinity and femininity. So presenting research, for example, about levels of choking during sex could perhaps work against uh, the reasons that we're learning about these important issues. Lastly, I think that increasing engagement uh, in consensual rough sex complicates the development and delivery of comprehensive holistic sex education. So previous research into, uh, sorry, by the Ministry of Education and, and Ministry of Education's reviews suggest that education in relation to sex and particularly in relation to pornography has been inconsistent uh, across the motu. Uh, we obviously have seen new guidelines coming through, uh, which is fantastic, um, but I do think it's important for us to think about how do we change our messaging in relation to our sexual education uh, around what rough sex is and how we have conversation, difficult conversations about consent in relation to these behaviours. So ultimately, I guess um, this is a very sort of preliminary presentation into how we're understanding rough sex, because rough sex still remains both an ill-defined concept, but also a problematic one. And we need much more research that critically interrogates this sort of emerging cultural phenomenon, particularly from a gendered perspective. Uh, I know that there is some research being done uh, by Professor Nicola Gaby at the University of Auckland around how people experience rough sex. Uh, so I'll be very much looking forward to seeing the results of that research when they come out. Um, but at this, as it stands currently, we still have rather limited knowledge about rough sex and we need an awful lot more work in this space to understand the complexities and also understand the breadth of experience across the board for people of different genders uh, and people of different sexualities as well. So thank you so much. And I'm really keen to hear any questions or comments that you might have. I've certainly seen the Q&A bubble pop up a couple of times. Uh, so really keen to have a chat with people about um, some of the, the research that I've presented on today. Kia ora, Sam. <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, that was incredibly, incredibly informative, really interesting. I think the way that you kind of really explained 
the definition, like why definitions are important, why our understandings are important, both on a theoretical level and at a practical level, uh, was, a, was a really key point and highlighting the kind of fluidity between theory and practice. Um, and I think looking at those intersections between how we understand BDSM and rough sex and choking within rough sex um, was a really important point. And I think there are a lot of um, questions and ideas are raised around how those understandings impact things like sex education or particularly working with young people. Um, and there's been some great kind of comments coming in talking about how difficult this is, um, particularly working with young people and the issues around um, being able to say or not say certain things within school contexts, um, and which is something that we can maybe discuss a little bit further later on. Um, and as well as people highlighting the issues with legislative definitions not necessarily really having many massive impacts for victim survivors because of the criminal justice systems. So I think those are some um, really important points. Um, I would like to kind of start looking at some of these questions. Um, and there's been obviously quite a few conversations and comments and questions around young people in particular. Um, and I think I just wanted to maybe get you to explore a little bit this idea that not only are we seeing this wave of the normalization of choking within kind of under 25s, um, but also as you highlighted in your uh, presentation, a lot of those porn categories are related to teenagers or, you know, perceived teenagers, whichever one it is. Maybe can you talk a little bit more about how choking is being kind of normalized within these youth cultures specifically? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in terms of thinking about choking during sex in particular, so much of the research of which it's limited, there's only about sort of four studies that I'm aware of to date uh, that have investigated this phenomenon. They've all been done with people between the ages of between around 18 and 30, so people in emerging adulthood. Um, I certainly wouldn't discount um, the idea that this is happening with people under the age of 18. Um, but again, we don't have much uh, data that sort of supports that. But what we do know is that we are certainly seeing this coming through, but this isn't to suggest that it's just 18 to 30 year olds, if you like, that are engaging in these behaviours. Uh, so obviously pornography does often um, have teen categories, if you like, but that is not the only type of pornography that exists. Um, the, the sort of play with ages, if you like, so old and young, for example, is pretty common as a trope. Um, and we certainly see uh, in a lot of contemporary pornography today, playing with the idea of step siblings uh, or step family members. Um, so depicting sort of faux incest, if you like, um, being presented as, as sort of older and young people engaging in these behaviours. But I think it's important to recognise the gendered nature of this. So it is typically men that are doing the choking, um, uh, particularly in relation to heterosexual pornography. So that's obviously my key area of interest as a, a cis heterosexual woman myself. Um, but certainly... Uh, we would probably see uh, the similar sort of dynamics in non-heterosexual pornography as well. So definitely need to be thinking about what we can do with, um, you know, sort of updating our messaging around rough sex for both 18 to 30 year olds, but also more generally thinking about the breadth of experience of people engaging in these behaviours as well. Yeah, definitely. And that you actually touched on something that I want to move on to around the gendered notion. But before um, we do, just as a reminder to everyone to please keep sending your questions through. And then we've also just popped a feedback form in the chat. If you could go and fill it out, it would be very much appreciated. Um, and Sam, I'm also just going to get you to turn your screen sharing off just so people can see your face. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, I really wanted to touch on this idea of um, the gendered notion because it's very, very prevalent within your research that this is something that men do to women. And I wanted to ask a bit about, like, how do you have any understandings of what this looks like or whether there's research within the non-heterosexual context and whether you think that the, within these contexts of rough sex happening within non-heterosexual relationships, it still is drawing on similar ideas of gendered power? 
Yeah, so I, I haven't um, encountered much that's looked at non-heterosexual relationships in terms of the research that's been published to date. Uh, the survey that I did allude to of the 5,000 American college students did include uh, non-heterosexual students in their research, and the, the figures were reasonably similar, uh, suggesting that this is occurring across the board. Um, but I think it's important for us to recognise that uh, we do need uh, for example, queer-specific researchers doing that kind of research. Um, but we do need to also constantly be thinking about the gendered sort of basis behind it, right? So the gendered notions of power and who's in charge. So when we think about, for example, the types of power relationships that might exist in non-heterosexual relationships, so who is the one performing these acts and the same issues around consent and negotiating and navigating um, consent in relation to rough sex, are, are present in non-heterosexual relationships too. But I do think if we are developing messaging around what we can talk to people about, um, that we are ensuring that that is appropriate to the audience that we're speaking to. Uh, so if we are giving information to, um, say, for example, a group of young people, uh, if we are allowed to talk about rough sex uh, <laughs> in sexual education, um, how can we talk about that in a way that is inclusive of everyone's experience across the board? Uh, regardless of, of the gender of the person that they're in or people that they're having sex with. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's something there along how the normalization of these highly gendered sexual practices are, you know, perpetuating very gendered ideas about gender stereotypes during sex, about giving and receiving and gatekeeping and who has power and who doesn't. So I think that um, this sex education there is really important. And talking about sex education, in terms of engaging, particularly with young people, do you have any ideas or advice around how sex education can better kind of incorporate these ideas, particularly as lots of our sex educators are young women? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, one of the things that is particularly important when we're talking with young people is around challenging some of the messaging that's coming through around pornography. So I think we are not, like we would be naive to think that young people are not viewing pornography, uh, but we certainly know that young people are and can be critical consumers of the content that they see. So I think it's really important to take a strengths-based approach uh, in relation to conversations about sex with young people. So how can we position and the type of sex that we may want to engage in uh, from a position that recognises that they can say no to the types of sex that they may not want to engage in, but also to have a think about where their pleasure is situated within that. So what does good sex look like? How can we have conversations about sex? Um, but also how can we resist some of the messaging that we see uh, coming through, particularly in mainstream pornography? Because we know that the majority of people are not engaging in, say, for example, feminist produced pornography. So I'm not sure how many young people would be paying for the pornography that they're viewing. Um, so the types of pornography they're seeing on the front page of places like Pornhub positions them in a space to be learning about, about sex from there. So if we aren't having open, honest and transparent conversations about sex in society generally, where do you go to learn about sex? So pornography can become a default educator. Absolutely. And, you know, from what we've seen, our sex education currently is very much based on, you know, what not to do around sexual health, around, you know, consent practices. Whereas from, you know, my experience, a lot of young people, they want to know how to have sex, how to do certain things. And so I do think that's something that we're lacking. Um, and I've got a question here, which is kind of around that. And um, this question is around breath and knife play. But and more broadly, if people are interested in engaging in, you know, these kind of BDSM or rough sex practices, where would you recommend that they go and get kind of comprehensive and safe advice? Yeah, so in, in relation to knife play, I would think that, that I mean, I'm, I'm no BDSM expert by any means, and I'm certainly not a BDSM practitioner, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, engaging with the kink community directly. So my understanding is that they have regular sort of uh, meetups where people can uh, find out information about their local BDSM community. Um, in relation to, so I, I'm not aware of research that suggests that knife play is a common 
engagement for people engaging in rough sex, if you like. Uh, but in relation to choking during sex um, or, or breath play, whichever you know sort of term you want to use for that, we certainly know that that is happening and that people are engaging in it. So if people are, a lot of our messaging also needs to recognise both this, the dangerousness of that behaviour. So we know that people um, during asphyxiation or, or restriction of breathing to the throat um, can, you know, uh, can result in death in the space of about two minutes, perhaps even less. Um, so sustained pressure to the neck. So thinking about where that occurs, on what place, um, and going to places uh, that are providing reputable information. So again, uh, like the King community. Um, the updated piece about engaging in choking uh, during sex, which was rewritten by Men's Health magazine, actually ended up providing more helpful information after that, uh, which couched the idea that if you are going to engage in these behaviours, then you need to do so safely. And these are the spaces that we recommend that you learn about that from. Um, but we certainly know that uh, a lot of choking during sex does not happen consensually. Uh, and we know that there are a significant uh, number of ramifications that can occur uh, during engaging in that behaviour. Uh, not obviously the worst case scenario is people engaging, uh, resulting in death. Uh, but certainly there are things such as, um, you know, bruising that comes through, uh, loss of consciousness, uh, loss of bladder control and um, continence of the body. So there are a whole range of factors there. Yeah. And I don't, think, it, and I don't think it's something that we should encourage, um, <laughs> you know, on a, on a broad scale. Uh, I think it's something that we, we need to ensure that the messaging that, that we're giving out is countering this idea that this is something that you should be engaging in um, because mm -hmm. it is, uh, it's important to recognise the, the dangerousness of that behaviour. Um, yeah, and you just touched on this um, article on men's health and I had a question about this. Mm -hmm. So what role do you think platforms like these mainstream media platforms have in being a, a, a platform for sex education? Do you think that this is a good thing or do you think this is something that we should be avoiding? I think it's difficult, right? So that men's health article went viral, like millions of views. Uh, and when it got updated, they went to public health experts uh, who do the research around rough sex, um, who provided quite helpful information about what we can do there. Um, but I do think, unfortunately, the media does put out unhelpful information about uh, what we understand sex to be and sexual practices. So uh, I think, you know, if we are going to have mainstream media places presenting information about rough sex, it's so critically important uh, that they are touching base and making sure that they understand what they're, um, you know, what they're presenting can be taken as gospel by people that are reading it. Uh, so making sure that it is well informed and well researched and comes from a place of understanding that this is the best information we could give is crucial. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Finally, um, just probably one of the last questions is around this the usefulness of this knowledge for practitioners. So for people who work um, with victim survivors, particularly kind of in social worker and crisis roles, what advice would you give them and how they can apply this kind of knowledge in their practice? Well, I think the first thing I would say is thank you for being open to thinking about the contemporary issues that are arising uh, during sex. Um, I recently met with members of the clinical forensic community, uh, so doctors for sexual abuse care, and thinking about um, how we can, you know, have healthy, if you like, or, or conversations with victim survivors of sexual violence around these issues and ask questions about whether that, you know, the behaviours that they experienced, you know, in relation to choking, for example, uh, how, how they experienced those and presenting it in a non-victim blaming way, which I'm sure everybody does. Uh, I know that the sector is incredible, um, but I think it's so important that we are aware of uh, how common these behaviours are and to ask about these behaviours. So to recognise that we certainly know that these behaviours are occurring uh, and to have a think about the context in which they're occurring as well if we are working with people on a, a long-term basis. Kia ora. Thank you so much. I think that concludes our questions and our presentation. Just a reminder that the feedback form is in the chat um, and that will be a chance to provide some feedback and also we will send out some 
um, resources. I know Sam has a couple of chapter, open access chapters um, that she's keen to share. So I will send those out with um, the email that goes out later on. Um, and so I'd just like to close with a karakia um, and thank you so, so, so much to Sam for taking the time out of the day to come and do this for us. I know that we really appreciate it. So, unihia, unihia, unihia ki te urutapa nui, ki a wātia, ki a mama, te ngāko, te tīnana, te wairoa i te ara takata, koi ara i rongo, whaka iri a aki e kirunga, ki a tīna, tīna, huye, taiki. Thank you so much. Please look after yourselves and get some, some support if you need it. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time.